of my favorite, one of my favorite people, um, one who has, is now a true hummingbird expert for the United States due to his great love for, for this particular group of birds. And um, I've had the wonderful opportunity to visit him a couple of weeks ago and see his yard and the wildlife that's there. And it's a true oasis, I think, in what otherwise is kind of a sad landscape for hummingbirds. So um, with that, Steve Bacchus, will you tell us about hummingbirds today? Be glad to. Oops. Oh, one more thing. Um, with regard to questions, if you have questions, would you drop them into chat? And um, otherwise, um, would you uh, hold them to the end unless Steve says, would anybody like to ask any questions at which point, you know, unmute yourself and go for it. Okay, thank you. Actually, Steve did say I that during his talk, that um, people could unmute and ask themselves. Correct, Steve? Yes, I did. Okay. So if you would like to ask him a question during the talk, go ahead. Otherwise, put them in chat or wait till the end. Okay. So you're, you can share your screen now. I'm going to have to start off with a technical difficulty. I clicked on the, uh, I grabbed the mouse and clicked on my presentation and lost my Zoom access. Judy, you're muted. Steve, just at the very bottom of your screen, there'll be a little Zoom icon. Just click on that and you'll pop back up. You're, I'm, still, uh, you're, nope. st you're still with us, Steve. I may have to close the uh, show and be able to get to, okay, now I'm back. Okay. Okay, that's all right. We all do that. So at this point, I want to share the presentation. There you go. Perfect. And hopefully it's going to do what I want it to do. Okay, so now we're good to go. No, not quite. Yeah, okay. Yes. All right, um, are we ready? Okay, my first question, first, first, Thing I want to approach is why me? And that's going to be a little bit of introducing myself. Um, the big picture, <clears throat> as Ann had said, um, I'm here because the yard that I, because I have the yard that regularly hosts the most wintering hummingbirds in Florida. Um, I've gained my fame from the numbers of birds in my yard and the numbers of species. Um, Beck, Years ago, um, I was a birder that chased rare birds. And during the winter, all of these Western species were being seen at birders' homes. And I said, how do these birds know who's a birder? And the reality was the only communication regarding bird sightings was between birders. And there's more birds, more hummingbirds in the winter than we realized it was just a small group of people were communing, communicating that they were there. Um, so back in the early 90s, um, well, actually back after Windows 95, when we all got internet and computers, I started creating websites that said, hey, these birds are there. I joined um, Listserv, did all sorts of stuff to try to improve the communication of sightings um, to locate more birds and to better understand the distribution. Um, over time, I've gotten the respect of my knowledge and what I've done, and I've been asked to give talks like this um, and talks to Audubon societies and plant societies. And um, so I've developed the respect of the communities around for the knowledge that I've built for myself. When I give these talks, I have a lot of information squeezed into a short period of time, and I tend to forget various things, but I say enough. So um, I started giving out contact information at the beginning. My email is bacchus1 at verizon.net. I 
don't do email as good as I used to, but I do try to get back to, uh, to, to respond to them. Um, I have a floridahummingbirds.net website, which I has information. It has my contact information. Um, I no longer really do much with it, um, but the information's out there and, and my contact information's there. Um, most of what I do promoting hummingbirds now is on Facebook, and I realize a lot of people aren't on Facebook. Uh, but I have a hummingbirds in Florida group that is very active throughout the state um, in both reporting the birds that they're seeing, as well as people asking questions, what to do, what to plant, how to, how to attract them to the yard. Um, one of the problems I used to run into being in Valrico when someone in Pensacola said, what do I do? What do I plant? And I tell them in my yard, I've got these tropical plants that, you know, get frozen up there before the hummingbirds are even there. So having local people involved in a group that can answer questions regarding local aspects um, is where I found Facebook to be the most beneficial. Um, so this talk is about landscaping for hummingbirds. Um, my experiences, which I've sort of explained at this point, um, emphasizing creating territories within your landscape um, it, birds, they're very territorial. They need an area where they feel comfortable that they can survive and then they'll allow birds outside of that range. If you have one plant, one feeder and an open yard, you're gonna have one hummingbird because he's gonna chase everything else away. Um, some talk on feeders, feeder styles, solution, how to feed them, uh, how, to, how to fill them. Um, various plants, and again, my plants, and fortunately, we're all like Tampa area, so that works better than if I'm giving a talk to, to Panhandle. Um, insects are very important. People overlook the fact that the majority of the hummingbird diet is insects, not sugar. Um, but it's hard to watch them feed on, you know, put out insects small enough for them to eat and then be able to watch it. So our focus is typically on feeders and and, and plants. Um, also water features are an interesting thing, watching them bathe in, in a, a shower of water or on wet leaves. Um, that, uh, and there is at least one um, bird bath that I know has gotten a lot of publicity as far as hummingbirds being able to sit in the running water and take a bath. I've not personally used one of those, but there's other options to put into the landscape to be able to attract birds to your yard. Um, if that takes up all my time, uh, I have an ending to the talk, but there's also, we banned hummingbirds in our yard and part of the research and the ability to identify an individual bird is, is interesting from the homeowner standpoint, from, from the hummingbird host standpoint to, to learn individual birds and to, to actually relate to them. Um, but it's also a scientific um, research aspect of being able to follow um, health aspects of the birds over the years, as well as their distribution and, and, and if they're returning back to the same sites or they dependent on the same sites on the winter or the summer. Um, so that's generally where I'm gonna go. If time permits, I've got a sec section on the banding. Um, so my history in 89, I moved to Florida. I was actually a birder interested in birds from my youth um, up in Illinois. Um, came down here and joined Audubon and went on field trips with Audubon and uh, Tampa Audubon Society. Um, got to know the people in, in the society and where to go, where to see birds and eventually um, recognizing what's a normal bird, regular bird to see and what's a rare bird um, and hooking up with those people who would drive a mile, an hour away, hour and a half away to see something that was rare. And pretty soon I was driving to Pensacola, staying a night, um, maybe a night on the way there, coming back and then driving to Key West and spending a whole week driving 2000 miles to see about eight birds. Um, so I kind of grew. Um, and along the lines, taught myself various things. In 1994, um, Debbie Grimes and Lutz had a young male ruby throat show up in her yard. 
and she was gracious enough to open the yard to the birders and we killed all her grass walking in circles looking at the bird throughout the winter. Um, and, and, and for that, the birders are very appreciative and I exaggerate a little bit about killing the grass, but there's always a concern with too many people walking into a backyard. And um, for that reason, I, I very much appreciate those who open their yard and I open my yard as well. Um, so this is a young male ruby throat. This is back in the days of manual Pentax K1000 camera, um, 35 millimeter, uh, not the great, digital that we have today, but the best I could do at the time. Throughout the year, throughout the winter, we went back to the yard over, you know, a few weeks at a time and uh, would watch this bird molt from this greenish dull brown bird to a brilliant rufous brown with a full gorget uh, before he migrated out. And that's probably when I fell in love with hummingbirds. Um, They're just amazing to watch everything they do. So I was living in a balcony at the time um, and I wanted to know how can I bring them to my yard? Um, and this is an example. And I kind of missed the ooze. <laughs> um, I <laughs> did all the research I could in 94, we didn't have the internet. So I bought a whole lot of books. I went to the library and once the internet came around, I joined Humnet, which is a listserv for hummingbird enthusiasts and hummingbird banders around the Gulf uh, out of Louisiana. Um, search online, I bought every plant I could from all the nurseries uh, in the area. Um, anything that said hummingbird, anything that looked like hummingbird, any, any things that I mis mistook what they were, they weren't what I thought they were, but they still attracted hummingbirds and I put them on my little balcony. And this is Carlton Arms North across from Lettuce Lake. Um, and hummingbird, ruby throateds breed along the Hillsborough River, um, nest at Lettuce Lake. And I would have them coming all summer, um, but never actually saw a winter hummingbird. That's where I had to go to Pensacola or Jacksonville or whatever to see wintering hummingbirds. Um, Along the lines that I put, killed a lot of fuchsias and columbines. I'm from up north where we had these plants that people grew and they just don't grow in Florida. But that was the experimentation, try everything. What lives, lives, what dies, dies. Um, then I bought a house in Valrico and it was a pretty empty yard. Um, so there was room to grow. And I had all those plants from my balcony. I had to find a place to put them. And we created a des design that was basically bordered the yard, bordered the house, bordered the tree. Um, and so what's on the left was the house when I bought it. What's on the right is five years later, just to kind of show the development of how I built the yard. We uh, ran it, ran the flower bed down the driveway here. Um, we tried to intermix flowering with non-flowering so that you had your something growing year round, but you had flowers for the hummingbirds. And for the most part, I don't have summering hummingbirds. So I emphasized what will bloom during the winter. Um, and the backyard, we kind of went crazy. And so this view on the top is the same as the view on the bottom. So um, I really had to expand more to show the full backyard with everything we planted. So we had an amorphous shape in the middle. Um, we we ran along the borders, a citrus hedge along the back, vines down one side, hibiscus down the other. Um, and within five years, this is how much it grew up. So um, with hummingbirds and butterflies in mind, um, driving the plants, it wasn't too hard to fill up the yard. We did a lot of, this is the territory I mentioned where it's an enclosed area. Um, this picture doesn't show the flowering plants, but it shows a feeder and there's flowering plants around there, uh, little hidden nooks where hummingbirds could feed without being challenged for their territory from a bird from another area in the yard. Um, between the, I, I referenced 2019 because the last two years haven't been the best years for uh, 
catching hummingbirds in my yard or attracting them between not having freezes and the bander that comes to the yard um, has had limited movement and timing is different in part due to the pandemic. So uh, I, I stuck with my 2019 numbers to kind of emphasize the point that from 2002 to 2019, we banded, trapped and banded 121 individual birds in the yard. Um, I have a little problem where I can't see my numbers, but um, I know that we banded over 100 ruby throated uh, hummingbirds in the yard, um, seven black chins, and more than 10 rufous hummingbirds. Um, just emphasizing the different species. Um, and the numbers of birds that my yard attracts. Um, you can see on the leg of the hummingbird in the picture, a band, you can see a four on it. Um, and that band allows us to recognize that bird the next year we catch it. Or um, in case of one bird that came back six years in a row and another bird came back seven years in a row. If he'd have come back this year, he would have been the oldest on record. So unfortunately, he didn't make it back. Um, the returning birds, as I mentioned, photographs can pick up the bands. They can pick up the numbers. We don't even have to catch and hold the bird to, to recognize which bird it is. Um, in 2019, we caught and banded 12 ruby-throated hummingbirds, one rufous. And four more went unbanded, which meant there were at least 17 birds using my yard. So I have a third acre yard um, and they're very territorial, but I'm able to manage those numbers of hummingbirds due to the landscaping choices that I've made. Um, young ruby throated hummingbirds, they're gorget. The red throat is a gorget. They grow in in different patterns. This is an ex example of four of the young birds that we caught that year, um, just to show that you can identify individual birds. Adult males, for the most part, are all looking about the same. Sometimes there's a different gorget feather hanging down or something where I can identify individuals. But the young males are interesting in that you can identify each individual one, usually based on the pattern of their gorget feathers. Um, the questions that come about is, if I want to attract hummingbirds, is when are they in my yard? Uh, what do I have to do to bring them to my yard, landscaping-wise, feeders, and as I mentioned before, insects and water are other options to consider. Um, the what, the where and when um, falls into the natural distribution of them. Where do they breed? Where do they winter? Where do they migrate through? And this slide shows the typical summering breeding range, which you can see is right about Tampa. So we're in that range where we do get some breeding. There has been breeding all the way down in Naples and Miami, but you're very rare to find one there. So um, the winter, it shows us shows them wintering here where they actually winter up into the Panhandle, up into Georgia. Um, but not common doing so, but regularly doing so. There's some that do. Um, and then your migrations, March to May and July to October, pretty much they'll be anywhere within the state during that time frame. So um, if you're not in a summering or breeding location, if you don't have the right habitat during migration, there's always the opportunity to catch something going through. So I emphasize at least at that point, to have flowers blooming and to have uh, feeders hung up. This is a eBird representation of wintering ruby-throated hummingbirds in Florida. So when you saw that line across Tampa that said they winter down below there, all those uh, purple marks above Tampa are reports of wintering birds. The darker they are, the more birds were, were involved. So to say, you know, I live in the wrong place in Florida to see a hummingbird in the winter is not accurate. And these are just those that are reported. Again, um, depending on the how well the communication is, every bird's not being reported. So you have a good chance of attracting a wintering hummingbird anywhere in the state. 
Um, with migrants, they're easier to attract um, because, because they're just going through everywhere. Uh, they may show up anywhere. It's unpredictable. They're short term. Migrants come in for a day or two and then leave. They might hit your feeder as they pass through, and that might be the only time. Um, they're less territorial, which means they you might see two or three at the same time. You might see a sharing of the feeder during that time. Um, but one drawback is that birds use feeders less often. They may not, especially in the fall where they're not trained that a feeder is food, they may just hit flowers. A lot of people always complain to me, well, they're, they're here, but they're not using a feeder. And, and that is because they're just hitting flowers as they move through. They haven't learned that a feeder is food. Um, and you don't, they don't really get to relate to you and you don't get to relate to them. Whereas with residents, there's regular visits, quite often a regular time frame of when they come in. Um, if they're the only bird there, there's long time sitting in view. If there's multiple birds, there may be the territorial one will be a regular and the others will slip in and slip out a uh, much shorter time frame. Um, the resident birds will also learn to develop a trust with you. Um, and in the case of the Rufus hummingbird that resided in my yard seven consecutive winters, if I went in the backyard, he would chip and come down next to me. And if I didn't look at him, he'd chip again. Um, if I went, and, and same with previous ones, if I walk in the right side of the yard and they're on the left side of the yard, they'll fly over the right side and sit near me uh, and vice versa. So the residents, sometime bond with you knowing that you're the one providing them the food you're the safe one to be with so it was kind of neat the last couple of years going out sitting in the corner of my yard just put up the chair in the shade and the hummingbird come down and sit and just sit 10 feet away on a branch and we just watch each other for an hour um, but the residents are very territorial and they will chase everything else away which is again why you need to set up different territories and blocks to be able to uh, accommodate more than one uh, bird. Uh, with territories, they need an acceptable food source, both feeders and flowers, and a perch. Perches for secure resting as well as defending. So I always emphasize put some flowers that are flowering nearby a feeder. The feeder is a guarantee. I got food. I can sit down. I can get a fill and I can fly away. Uh, but they do like flowers. They like the very, the, the, the variety of the flowers as well. They like a shrub that they can sit in and kind of hide and rest where they're not being harassed by anything. But they also like to defend their territory where they can sit up on top on a high point and look down. So trees are great for that. Um, the shrubs that, a shrub can serve both purposes if there's an internal perch to sit inside as well as a place outside where they can watch that feeder and chase anything away. Um, so Steve, with was multiple that a fire spike? Sorry? Steve, was that a fire spike? That yes, that plant. was a fire spike. I've got three varieties. I've got two purple and the red. One of the purples is similar to the red, and the other purple is, is considerably different. I will have pictures of those later when I get to the flowers. OK, thanks. Um, the visual blocks, the building, the first thing I tell people is hang a feeder on both sides of the house. Because if you have a bush in the backyard, a bush or tree in the front yard, you've got a feeder relatively close to the house that can't be seen from the backyard, um, then the bird in the backyard can't chase the one in the front yard away. Um, and tall plants, I've got a, uh, some citrus trees, I've got a big powder puff. Um, and as I go through the pictures of my yard, you'll see how there's, there's large clumps of bushes that a bird can feed on one side and not be seen from the other side. Um, and then the areas of food, um, plants and feeders. I mentioned if you've got a nice, some nice flowering plants and a feeder nearby that fits as a territory, a bird will be satisfied with that and allow birds on the other side. And I've actually got bushes where a bird will sit on one side of the bush and defend that feeder and there'll be a feeder on the other side of the bush and they'll defend that. So. I've even in my yard, they will share one bush so long as they've got a separate 
feeding area within their site. Um, their primary food that we see is nectar for energy, but insects are the protein as well as energy. And actually in a frost, in, in a frost situation like we're in right now, where I've got no flowers in the yard, um, small insects up in the trees come out faster than we realize. And they can, if there's enough insects in the trees to feed on, they can get by without nectar. But they sure like feeders if, if that's available. And so typically with a freeze like we just had, I'll hang out extra feeders. And within three days, I'll have considerably more hummingbirds using the yard. Back in the days when I had five hummingbirds using the yard, I might have 10 hummingbirds three days after a freeze because the neighboring birds in neighboring yards with flowers and no feeders, suddenly they're looking for a place for a good feed. So I always encourage hang, hang, hang feeders after or leading up to and then after a freeze. Um, could, I, could I make a comment? Yes. Sandy, I just, I just wanted to say, I put out a lot of fruit because of the different birds that are in my yard. I have a few hummers and it seems like the fruit attracts a lot of uh, fruit flies. And yes. I see, the, and I see the hummingbirds um, zipping by the fruit, um, you know, getting the fruit flies. I just wanted to comment on that. I just happened to notice that, and when you mentioned it, I thought, oh, I should say that because that that it, is one of the that is one of the practices is to put out a fruit fruit slurry that will attract hummingbird uh, will attract fruit flies as well as hanging banana peels. There's a few different ways to do that. Um, and that's true. Um, and typically the, the nectar is at the base of flowers. I've got cardinals that eat my flowers at the base to get to the nectar. Um, but that is the tubular flower that's good for hummingbirds is because it's kind of restricts a lot of the birds that are, a lot of the insects as well that feed on nectar through the flower. Um, Feeders supplement the diet, and as I said, it's a quick fill in circumstances that's very beneficial to the hummingbirds and preferred to the hummingbirds. Multiple feeders reduce the territorial benefits. Um, in my case, I put multiple feeders throughout the yard with blocks so I can have more birds in the yard. Some people will hang like 15 feeders in one place. And every time a bird gets chased away, it goes to another one. And pretty soon the territorial bird says, you know what, it's not worth it. There's enough food. And in some cases, especially out west in places where there's more birds, um, that's beneficial in, in keeping more birds in one area. Um, shade, the heat on the feeder has disadvantages and wind will dump the sugar water. So shady areas and protected areas, of course, are better for hanging feeders, but it doesn't mean you can't hang one out in the middle of the yard in the sun. Um, and as I said before, out of view of other feeders, cuts down on territorial fights. This is uh, in a pass in West Virginia. There were 58 hummingbirds around the feeders in one picture that I had. Uh, they're migrating, they're less territorial and just needing food, but it's kind of an example of a lot of a lot of available food, and there's potential for more um, birds. This type of thing in Florida is throwing away a whole lot of sugar water because we just don't have 58 birds to feed at one porch. <laughs> um, there's various types of feeders, and and there are people that have their favorite type, and that's what they'll use. Um, there are ones that are easier to manage than others. Um, but where I'm trying to get every bird, every species uh, that's in the area to want to come to my yard, I try to put a mixed variety of them so that if, if the bird learned to feed on one feeder in its breeding range and then it comes here and it doesn't recognize the styles I have, it may not stop. So I do offer ver a variety of styles in hopes that what's there will be recognized. Um, in Florida, the smaller the better because you're just not going to go through a lot of sugar water. There's not that many and we usually have enough flowers that the sugar water is a supplement and not a requirement. It's good to have a clear holding tank because then you can see if 
there's still sugar water there and if it's clear as soon as it gets foggy you're just going to chase the birds away if it's sour uh, or cloudy so it's, it's important to monitor the um, the freshness of the sugar water that you're putting into it um, and as i said fill with a minimal minimal amount because it's not going to they're not going to use that much before it's going to sour. Change it often. Um, these are a couple of the dish feeders that I have, the four ounces, three holes. For the most part, you're just going to have one bird on a feeder at a time. So the big feeders aren't beneficial here. Um, they're beneficial out west where you've got five around a feeder at one time and you're going through a gallon a day on one feeder. Um, but these small ones are very beneficial. These dish feeders, you pop the top off, you wipe it, you clean it, uh, very easy to maintain. They don't leak, so you reduce the number of bee is issues that you have with it because it takes the tongue to go down into the liquid. So they are definitely an advantage of that. The, there's various tube feeders. Um, you can make your own, uh, buy them. Um, this is a tweeter totter. There's one on each side. It tips back and forth. When the bird lands on it, it's supposed to have enough weight to, to bring the nectar forward. But even if it doesn't, in this case, the tongue goes out far enough and gets the nectar. These are right outside my, my living room window. And there's certain birds just love them. Um, and they're also very easy. Get a small bottle brush, pop the top off, wipe it, they're clean. Um, the plastic one on the left, I put that in. That was kind of funny. I was taking a picture of the anole on the uh, feeder. And after I looked at my photos, I saw the hummingbird came in. I didn't even see it when I was taking the picture. Um, so, but that's a cheap plastic one. Um, and they are cheap. Didn't come with a perch. I've added my own little perch to them, but um, they do get used. So I use them. Um, the one on the right is Perky Pet Four Fountain Feeder. That's probably the most recognized feeder of hummingbirds um, which is not necessarily a good thing because there's a lot of flaws to it but if anyone's trying to track hummingbirds and not having success i always say use that one um, at least try that before you give up they leak they're a big problem with bees they have improved the ability to clean the bottle they used to have a small neck on the bottle which was very hard to clean um, but it is by far, they're also very hard to clean. Those bee guards are hard to clean. There's question as to the, the, the potential for harm for uh, uh, Bill being inside the bee guard and then being attacked and chased away. Um, so if the birds didn't prefer them, I wouldn't use them, but the birds prefer them, so I use them. Um, there are nectar mixes you can buy, but I recommend against it. You're paying a lot of money for sugar. Um, you can pour it out of the bottle. It's clean, but the recommended is four parts sugar, one part water. Boil to dissolve, strictly just to dissolve. When you're boiling your nectar mix, it's not to sanitize it. Hopefully your water's safe to drink um, and the sugar safe to eat. So it's more a matter of being able to dissolve it. If you want to put sugar in water and set it out for a while and shake it up to dissolve it, that's fine too. Um, no coloring necessary. They like to say, you know, there, there's colored nectars on sale. So you're got red nectar in there, but the bird sees what it's feeding on. It doesn't see the liquid and there's enough red on the feeder. Um, there is concern with the food colorings and nectars and the, the banders and rehabbers who deal with hummingbirds that are feeding on those colored nectars do see pink, urine from them and and so in general i recommend stay away from the commercially bought ones and stay away from food coloring um honeys and sugars uh, honeys a lot of people want to use honey it sticks to the bill causes mold and can be severely detrimental to the hummingbirds so don't use that and hummingbirds need the sugar they don't need to be on a diet so artificial sweeteners aren't the answer either um, Typically, various places will say 
twice a week, once a week, depending on temperature. Florida is almost never cold, as I say, as it's freezing outside. But um, for the most part, Florida is always like the summer up north. So if up north, they say during the heat, change out every two to three days. But when it's cool, leave it four days. Uh, we don't have many of those four day four day between change days. So typically just go two to three days, four days and uh, make sure it's clean. The worst case scenario, I mean, if you let it go bad, it can be detrimental to the bird and the bill. But um, if you let it start to go bad, the bird can say that's sour, I'm not coming back and, and, and defeats the purpose of hanging the feeder out if the bird doesn't see it as food. Um, there's recommendations to clean with vinegar or bleach, those would be very dilute and have to be rinsed and have to be able to dis dissipate out. If you clean often enough, just hot water, hot tap water, for the most part, I just use hot tap water and a bottle brush to, to brush anything that might be on it. Um, hopefully I don't let thing, anything get so bad that I need bleach. Um, use an ant guard, bee guards. I know places, people who take the bee guard, the yellow bee guard off of that, and they, they're fine, but if you've got bees, bees will go inside there and drown. So you do need something to make sure that a bee can't get inside of it. And um, the ants, I, I, I've got better pictures of the ant guards. Um, they sell some really small ant guards that the ants I have in my yard just walk over them. So you need a big enough guard to make sure that two or three can't make a bridge or they can't swim. Um, they do sell ant guards with a poison inside that I don't recommend. And people will recommend putting uh, various things on the shepherd's hook to prevent things from crawling over that. And even there, if you're talking oils or things that are sticky, it's something that bird has a potential to touch a wing on. So I just recommend the ant moats. And these are a couple of ant moats that are being used for purposes other than that. Um, I kind of threw the picture in the left to show that I use my, during the summer when I don't have hummingbirds, I use my hummingbird dish feeder to feed mealworms to bluebirds. Um, their ant mode up above prevents the worms from crawling up the hook and down. And basically um, it, it blocks the solid path from the ground into the feeder. Um, and the ant moats, if they're kept with water are used by other critters, um, this frog, but also I've had birds bathe in it, drink from it. Um, so it, it winds up being a water source for other birds. Um, so plants for hummingbirds, um, flowers or food, trees and shrubs for security, brightly colored flowers, typically red tubular says food, um, plant patches of red flowers and consider a variety of blooms all year until you know when you expect the birds to be um, in your yard. Um, recommended plants, there's plenty of websites, Facebook groups, um, birding groups, gardening groups that I'm part of. Hummingbirds are often a topic um, and there's plenty of information out there, various blogs. Um, the internet is great for information. Um, extension office is added here because I initially stole this talk from somebody from the extension office. <laughs> but they have freebie lists and, and things, and they are a place to get information for that sort of thing. Uh, bird feeding stores typically emphasize that, but they're also going to sell you that nectar that I said don't buy, but that's my recommendation. Um, and nurseries, anyone who's dealing with flowers, anyone who's dealing with birds is going to have information to help out from that standpoint. Um, I might be running long. Uh, same as. Uh, you're, you're good, Steve. Take as much time as you want. Okay. You're doing I great. Afraid, I was afraid of being short. <laughs> um, your options are all of one kind of plant that you know they like or a variety. And, and uh, there's pluses and minuses to both. A lot of people want natives um, from. That's a great thing, but unfortunately, non-natives tend to do a much better job of 
attracting birds. Our natives, possibly the reason we don't have so many here is our natives didn't develop in a, in, in a way to support the numbers of birds we want to see here or the numbers that come here. Um, consider the blooming season. Red flowers typically say food, but there are plenty of non-red flowers that hummingbirds regularly use. Um, consider perching sites when you're landscaping and consider other birds. The sounds of other birds actually say this is a safe place to be. A lot of people are afraid of, should I hang my feeders far away from the other the seed feeders? And you can see in this picture here of my backyard a number of years ago, I mixed the hummingbird feeders with the seed feeders and they would be there at the same time. So that's not a problem. Um, so I've got a few pictures showing the plants in my yard and how I've designed and how I've created different territories. Um, my walkway to my front door um, when we don't have a freeze. Um, <clears throat> but I've got some shrimp plant down below and some, uh, there's a cassia for butterflies. It's a great perching plant and powder puff and the red plant to the right, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, canna lilies. Um, unfortunately, a lot of what I plant winds up being weeds, but um, that's uh, <clears throat> that's part of the learning process. Um, but what doesn't work, I'll remove, and and what winds up being weed, I don't offer to others. The one on the left is the flowering maple is a great plant. I've got one of the small feeders just hanging there, um, room around it, but definitely hidden to where. Other territorial birds won't be able to see this. So there's one bird will be able to live in this area, uh, reside in this area un, unharassed. Um, and it's kind of the same picture I had before. Uh, native plants, firebush uh, is there. There is a native variety of firebush that's easily found. There are also non-native varieties. I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, coral bean for my yard is too late of a bloomer. It's more of a spring bloomer. Um, coral honeysuckle, someone had mentioned that earlier. It's a great plant. I just, my yard doesn't have the place for it. Neighbors have great coral honeysuckles. Uh, I think I've got too much other stuff in the, in areas where I've tried to plant it. Um, necklace pod, scarlet sage will reseed all over the place. Um, standing cypress needs wet ground. I think it's, it's a little bit harder to grow and, uh, Trumpet vine. Trumpet vine over by Lettuce Lake is the first place I saw hummingbirds uh, high up in the trees. Um, <clears throat> it has its disadvantages, but but it is uh, loved by the hummingbirds. I actually am against vine nowadays. I have the cypress vine on the right, and I can't get rid of it. It grows over everything, drops seeds all over the place. The coral honeysuckle, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is a native. Uh, Mature trees, the oak trees that we used to have in my yard um, were what I considered the main attractant because that tree in the picture would have, I could walk around and find seven or eight hummingbirds resting. Um, and they would each have a territory down below in the yard. Unfortunately, they live a little bit shorter than the time my house has been here and most of them have fallen down. Um, citrus trees are a good short tree that has room to sit in, the, the flowers attract insects that they can feed on. Um, and so that's been a good one for attracting the hummingbirds. Bottle brush has the flowers uh, and various flowering tropical trees uh, have the benefit of being a tree as well as attracting the hummingbirds. Thought I did that. Mm. Uh, oh. um, Various shrubs and flowers um, that I've got in my yard, flowering maple, bottle brush, uh, the coral bean I mentioned, powder puffs. There's the miniature dwarf powder puffs, and then there's a full-size powder puff, which is a winter blooming one with a like two or three inch flower <clears throat> ball um, that's done very well in my yard. The cassias in my yard are for perching. They're also the larval food for the orange part, sulfur butterfly. Um, the fire bushes, Turks caps, um, Jatropa, Vitex, and Pentas. Uh, fire spikes are, you break them, drop them on the ground, and they grow, and they're great for hummingbirds. Um, and, and pretty much any salvia, any of the porter weeds, 
Roselia shrimp plants. Uh, I've got a great Chinese hat in the front yard, which is where we first saw the Calliope hummingbird uh, show up this year. Um, uh, and then various lilies, which I haven't had that many growing in my yard, but I've had people tell me that the hummingbirds are all over the lilies when they're in bloom, kufias and lantanas. Um, this is the flowering maple inside there. There's like three or four big drops of nectar. They're great. The hummingbirds as well as orioles um, and the other birds will go in there and, and feed on those. The bottle brush is another nectar filled uh, plant when it's blooming. Um, that's the coral bean flower that I referred to earlier. It, it blooms in the spring. It's not as uh, beneficial to my yard. And the powder puff I have blooming in the yard now is that really big one. And I've had two birds that have been residing on one bush in my backyard uh, this, this winter. The door Dave, fire bush. Yes. This is Tammy, and I have a question. Um, okay. Well, you're getting ready to talk about the fire bush, and you said that was a drop and grow kind of um, plant. The, so, the is, are there spikes. any? Oh, fire, the fire spikes. spikes. Thank yeah. you. Um, is there any others that are that easy to grow, the drop and grow, as you call them? Um, I don't know. I've got a number of them that grow up and drop down and root on the ground and create a base that then can be pulled up and, and moved. Um, but they're rooting themselves. Um, the fire spike is the only one in, on my mind at the moment that, that's okay. that easy. OK, thank you. OK. The, the dwarf fire bush, I have a few of those, and the native fire bush, the, the dwarf fire bush, the leaves stay green, and, and the flower is more of a yellow, and it grows much bigger than the native. Strange term of dwarf, but uh, the native is that red with the yellow inside of the flower. Uh, this is my small dwarf that got up to about 15 feet tall. Um, mm. The picture on the right, I have to include that just because I thought I was videoing, but I was taking a picture and that was a lucky shot. Um, pentas were my first hummingbird flower, which is not typically a hummingbird flower, it's a butterfly flower, but the old tall red pentas are great for having nectar and, and hummingbirds will, will feed on that one often. Um, these are the fire spikes. There's a red fire spike and a purple fire spike are uh, the same thought to be the same species. I think the purple one's getting a different name at this point, or at some point they were considering renaming it. Um, these are just to show a young male Rufus hummingbird using that flower. Um, and then the one on the right is the other purple, the third, the second purple um, fire spike. It's um, a different species altogether. Um, it's got wrinklier leaves and the flower is different. Um, I include the salvia. This picture of a salvia is the um, is one they sell in stores. It's big and showy, but unfortunately, big and showy quite often means less nectar. They 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 lose nectar production in order to get the big showy flower. So a lot of times, actually, the smaller flowers are almost better for nectar. Um, Bailey sage, salvia miniata. It's not one I see in stores much. I got it one time. Uh, it might have actually been a freebie from USF's Botanical Gardens. Um, one plant turns into what you see on the right. Uh, eventually, they just touch and root and move. And most of my plants, I got one of them, and, and they now like fill large flower beds. Uh, this one's sensitive to the sun, sensitive to the heat, grows better in the shade. But whatever burns, wilts, or whatever, it comes back and does great. Uh, Tropical sage, this is one they sell in, in the stores. It reseeds all over the place, um, which would be weeded, which would be a weed, but they're easy to weed and, and you actually want them. So that's a good thing. Um, but these are two examples of non-red, the forsythia sage and the black and blue salvia are both great for hummingbirds. So um, red is not critical but it typically says I've got good, good nectar. Um, the Roselios, the Chrysiformis, and uh, um, Sarmentosa both go as firecracker flower, I think, or red rocket or something. Various common names for, you know, various plants have this, have 
more than one common name, so it's kind of hard to use common names sometimes. But these are a lot of flowers in a small place. They're tubular. They're they're excellent for hummingbirds. Um, more of the sarmentosa for, for looks. Um, kufias, cigar flowers. The Schumann's kufia is a great one, but hard to find. It's kind of sprawly. Um, doesn't make a really nice bush, uh, a, a solo bush. Um, so a lot of those are kind of harder to find, but um, they're both good tubular flowers. And and I've seen bat-faced goofia out there. There's a couple of different varieties of bat-faced goofia, but back in 1998, I think I took this picture and it's always been my favorite picture of a bat-faced goofia. Um, shrimp plants, all the shrimp plants are good. I've got a whole lot of good pictures of hummingbirds on shrimp plants because a lot of people with good cameras visit my yard. Um, that was once one plant. Um, and, and that's kind of what the shrimp plants do is if you let them as they take over an area and create a large area with flowers. Uh, again, more pictures of hummingbirds on shrimp plants. The Chinese hat is, um, this is a plant where I had one plant, it grew up, tipped down and rooted, grew up and dipped down and rooted. So I wound up with a bunch of them. I planted in a few different places. I've got a huge, uh, um hedge in the front yard which is where we watched the calliope hummingbird uh the first day that we saw it um it's now all flowers gone but um it'll come back after the freeze as well uh just an interesting shot of a hummingbird feeding on the flower the flower is the dish with the just a tubular flower coming off of that hat um porter weeds are good um the native porter weed is a blue one that has fewer flowers. Most of what you'll see is non-native, um, pink, purple, blue, uh, or red. Heliconias are great. They're actually designed for hummingbirds feeding on them. Where, where they're native, there are hummingbirds that strictly feed on them and pollinate them. Um, tropical, so sensitive to the weather here, so they have their drawbacks to depend on them anyway. And then there's a lot of annuals that can be put in at certain times of the year to fill in areas. Um, and I should say one thing I always talk about, there, there's always all this talk about what's the best, what can I plant for hummingbirds? And we get into these conversations of strictly hummingbirds and most of what my yard is hummingbird, but the reality is plant a few things for hummingbirds that they're gonna like and plant what you like as well. Um, so remember blooming all year um, until you know when you're gonna have birds in your yard. Consider the insects and the feeders um, and predator protection. Um, insects, well, this isn't quite what you, hummingbird eats insects wise, but uh, I have to acknowledge Roger Newell for this photo. It just looks great. Um, for insects, limited pesticide use, fruit trees, uh, fruit scraps, spider webs, um, sat from woodpecker wells, um, and many of them are caught in flight, swallowed whole. They don't have the ability to chew. Actually, not many of them, all of them are caught in flight. They don't have the ability to chew. Basically, they have to fly into it and swallow it. Um, but they can eat ants, aphids, beetles, gnats, mites, mosquitoes, spiders, Austin weevils if they're small enough and if they're able to get their mouth on them. Um, I had the the powder puff that I mentioned before. One year it was starting to look bad. There was a lot of black on it. It was dripping a lot of sap. Um, and I realized it had white fly and I was preparing to treat for white fly until I realized there were three rufous hummingbirds in the backyard and they were all spending a lot of time around that plant. And I realized the hummingbirds were eating the white flies. So I held back on the soap and the plant suffered that year, but the hummingbirds got a lot of food. So um, I would watch, when I, when I would watch the Rufus in the backyard, he would be sitting there um, and then he would pick up and fly up into the cherry tree and he would hawk insects up in the top of the cherry tree and then he would come down to the feeder. So he would eat numerous insects and then come down and wash it down. Um, and that's when I realized the tops of the big oak trees, not only 
good safe place to sit, but also tons of food. So even if there's pesticides on the ground, if they're not getting up to the tree, there's still gonna be insects up there. Um, so keeping that in mind, I, I do recommend limiting pesticide use where possible um, for the hummingbirds. Water, I mentioned, uh, I, I've got sprayers set up in my yard and it's a neat thing to, uh, there's one right outside my living room window and I spray it into the cassia um, border weed uh, clump and they come in and like this bird in the picture, they catch the spray on their back and they'll wash their belly in the wet leaves. Um, and, and they'll do this during the rain as well. If you're watching and rain's coming down, they'll either wash on wet leaves or on that uh, in the spray. So I had the misters. There is a bird bath or two. I've only one time seen one actually dip its belly into my bird bath, but mine aren't designed for it. Um, I typically see them bathing on big like hibiscus leaves in the morning dew, uh, or as I said, the rains. This is the only feeder I know of, and I'm not promoting Kmart, I'm not promoting the feeder. I'm putting this here as an example. With the water flowing down the ridges, they're able to sit on the ridge and actually bathe in there. So um, I have not had one myself. I just had a lot of people praise this as a hummingbird bird bath. Um, so remember, no space, no space is too small. This is my balcony again. Um, and my contact information to re repeat that. And I can open for questions. We can go to do the banding part. Um, I'm flexible at this point. Uh, for those watching the time, what's best to do? Well, Steve, um, I have a question. When you were at the apartments <laughs> and your balcony looked like that, what did your neighbors <laughs> think? Everyone except the one down below us would stop in awe. <laughs> um, you kind of have to get to know the one down below and rinse off their patio. <laughs> so, but otherwise, everyone was in awe of, of all the flowers but maintaining it drips down to the patio below. So long as the person below wasn't in a situation where that was a problem, we were good. Okay, well, I, I would imagine, I, I mean, that would be my reaction. I would be in awe also. Um, so we don't have any questions in chat yet, um, but if anyone has uh, a question, you can unmute yourself and ask it. And um, if we don't have questions here in a minute, we'll let Steve go on and talk about his banding. But any questions out there? Steve? I have a question. Oh, yes. sorry. Uh, Steve, what were the two non-red flowers that you talked about? Um, they were for Scythia sage, which is kind of difficult to find. It's a yellow salvia. Um, okay. And if it survived the freeze, you're welcome to come to my yard and get some. Um, and black and blue salvias. Um, okay. That's that. There, there's purple salvias. So the, that's kind of a bluish one. Um, it's just kind of an emphasis of, I'm trying to think of, well, there's also the golden shrimp plant is a very yellow with white flowers. So it's another one that, um, doesn't have to be red, but but it will be covered with hummingbirds. Okay, thank you. Steve, before we go to the banding, mm -hmm. could you talk about the calliope for a moment? Yes. Um, I, I kind of took the different species out in the banding and I, I, I have a list of the 13 species that have been seen in Florida. Um, the one of, I, I mentioned that I started out being interested in hummingbirds due to the rare birds and the different birds other than ruby throated that are in the yard uh, that are in Florida. And my yard has, has attracted rufous, black chinned, and ruby throats. Um, this past, uh, actually three weeks ago, um, Anne was in the yard with a group of young birders and I spotted a bird that had a pink long feather coming off of the gorget, which my experience and knowledge says that's a calliope hummingbird, which has not been seen 
in my yard before. So it's a fourth species. It has been seen, it was seen, um, I think in 2014 in Lutz and one was in Lakeland in 1994. So, and those are the southernmost records of that bird. So this is now the southernmost record in the state for this species. And it, it's very rare. There are five currently being reported in the United States. So that just emphasized the rarity even further. Um, it looks like a small green bird with a little bit of rufousy on the sides. The throat is very filled um, with, with spots, spotted stripes, which are stipples. It's just that one pink long feather and two central feathers are what tip off what it is. It also has a thinner bill. It's a smaller bird. The wings are the length of the tail. There, there's uh, other aspects that say that's what it is once I realized it. Um, one of the pictures in the banding portion has an adult male calliope, which is stunning. So we, we definitely have a rarity in the yard. This morning, just before getting on here, I was in the yard and I managed to find him on a feeder with the freezing and the loss of, loss of flowers. All the birds in the neighborhood are changing their routines and chasing around and making it harder to find who's who, but I did finally find him and I found another interesting one that may very well be a, a female or young male black chin hummingbird. So that may be all four species in my yard now, or no, no Rufus, three, three species in my yard again. So understanding and knowing the fine details that differentiate birds that otherwise look very similar is a little difficult. What was the other one you thought you saw? A uh, female or a young male black chinned hummingbird, just the tail was pumping all over the place and it had a relatively big bill, but I was kind of rushing to get inside and one of those days where I need my video camera and I ran inside and couldn't find it because it was in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we do have a... I, by the time I got out, a ruby throat chased her away. <laughs> oh, we have uh, one question from chat. Okay. Um, do you ever come to a person's house and make recommendations for feeder placements? So Steve is a working guy and he took off work today. We appreciate that so much, but I'll let you answer that, Steve. You probably don't have a whole lot of extra time. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't say for sure. I open my yard to invite people over at, at times when I can and, and discuss things and show what I've done in my yard and offer plants from my yard and offer people the opportunity to see the birds in my yard. Um, it would depend on what we could arrange off, off this discussion. <laughs> I can't guarantee it, but if it's not too far out of the way and the timing works out, uh, I wouldn't be against it. Steve, I okay. think we really um, enjoy seeing your banding talk. Okay. Yes, I, st I started to say, if nobody else has any other questions, we'll go to the banding and maybe we'll have time for questions after that. Okay. So I have, in case that was the end, this is the um, trumpet vine, um, a classic picture of the end. <laughs> um, so part of why do I attract hummingbirds, the enjoyment and for the knowledge we can glean from it, a um, couple of pictures of banding. Um, Banding research, there's, it's, a, it's a license is required. The people coming to my yard are, are banded in the US and have to have a permit in Florida to handle the hummingbirds. Um, their research is showing the movement of the individuals and, and in general for the species and helps to aid in survival in some aspects and to understand their behavior. Um, Tracking individual birds. The band allowed me to know that the same female was in my yard six winters in a row. And, and Rufus hummingbirds breed between southern Alaska, northern California, into Idaho. So this is every summer they go back to that range. And every winter they come to my yard. They show up in my yard the first, second week of August. They leave the second week of March. Um, the timing of the individual birds arriving and leaving were so amazing, almost, you know, just days apart. Um, unfortunately, we never caught 
him or her in the summer to know where they went. But there was one Rufus that was caught in Tallahassee that was then caught in Alaska, 4,000 miles away. So by finding them on both sides, we realized that uh, part of the question that we're trying to answer is, are all the Florida birds coming from the same general area out west? Is, is one population developed the coding to come here versus heading south? Or um, is it just this random mutation that's going across the board within the species that sometimes they wind up heading east instead of south? Um, all of this eventually, it's, it's a needle in a haystack when you consider the number of birds out there and the number we're actually catching. Um, so hopefully at some point we'll get enough points to be able to put stuff together and actually realize um, is, is where are they originating from? If there's some catastrophic event, is this population the one that's going to survive? That sort of thing. Um, tracking individual birds, identification. In some cases, birds are, are very, species differences are very similar. And so you almost need to have the bird in hand to look at individual feathers to verify what species it is. Uh, so, and then documenting the numbers that we have here and just general knowledge. Um, a lot of science is gathering up knowledge so that when you realize how to put, to, put it together, you can. So even if I can't say this knowledge we've gained is for this, it's knowledge. So um, it's important. The way we do it, so we set up a trap. This is two examples of the trap. The one on the left, you can kind of see the open door. Um, the way it works is we, I think a next picture will show it better, but that door is, is a sliding door. It's attached to a fishing line, which you can kind of see coming off of the cages. Um, we sit back holding the fishing line and there's a feeder inside the cage and we watch the bird quite often go around the feet, around the cage, under the cage, on top of the cage, search the whole thing out before recognizing there's a door where it can get to the feeder. And that's the picture on the right. You can see the Rufus hummingbird about to enter the door. The one on the left is Doreen Kuvi, who used to come down occasionally and, and ban birds in my yard. And when the bird goes in, you just release the wire, the, the fishing line, and it closes the door and the bird's caught. Uh, and then she and Fred both worked off of their, the, the back of their trucks. Um, and they're able to determine that they've got a card they fill out, they determine the species and the age of the sex and, and they weigh it. Um, I guess we're not showing the scale here, but then they make note of the bill and tail and wing lengths and, and health and the plumage and um, everything they can identifying um, the bird. So that in the future, if there's a, if there's a, damage to it if we recapture it later they can see if it healed or not um, and, and aspects like that as it's healthier um, there's a lot of photos taken and then the bird is usually released around here he'll put it on somebody's hand who gets to look at the bird look at a hummingbird sitting on their hand before it flies away um, these are the types of pictures he takes. This one's showing the throat, showing the feathers on the gorget. That little bit of purple in the center, that is a black-chinned hummingbird, which is the Western version of the ruby-throated, but it has a black throat with a purple band on the bottom. Um, mm. And then the side shot, the black chins typically be, are duller in my yard. There's more wear on the feathers. I'm not sure if that's a, a physical issue with the feathers or if it's just they've gone through a lot to get here but I've always noticed that you notice how dull the bird is in this picture the bill is also longer and slightly curved down where the ruby throated bill is straight and oftentimes thinner um, picture of the back shows again the, the general coloration of this bird um, you can kind of see the purple gorget feathers in the center on the bottom of the throat there again um, the, typically, the tail feathers and the wing feathers, the outermost wing feather on this bird comes to a blunt tip, whereas with a ruby throated, it narrows down to a, uh, to a pointed tip. 
more of a pointed tip. So the, these pictures kind of help identify that this is what this bird is. They're in hand and and not always the best clarity. So this this is what this picture shows. It's just not the best picture to for me to specifically point that out. But then each bird gets recorded, the band numbers recorded, and then it's submitted to the bird band laboratory. Uh, and so if this bird's ever caught again and the band is red, they can they would contact this um, bird banding laboratory and it would be able to track it back to Fred who banded it. Um, and they would have the records of how often this bird was found, where it was found, what condition it was found um, in order to hopefully develop, uh, to, to build enough information to one day be used. Um, when we catch them, we put a stripe of liquid paper on their head, in this case, pink, so that the bird can be recognized as a banded bird for a brief period afterwards until it wears off or, it, or is lost in the molt. Um, the benefit here is if uh, this bird goes into the cage, again, we can see the pink on it and not close it, not, not stress the bird again. Um, it also, on one, at least one occasion, one year we caught all three birds in my yard and banded them. And the next day they all showed up without pink lines on their head. And the next day they showed up with pink lines on their head. And I realized I had a match for each one that wasn't caught. So I had six birds instead of three. And they, they had like one gorget feather on the middle and two on the side, you know, and then there, there was like a doppelganger for each one I had. So again, marking it helps me recognize that I have birds that weren't, that weren't caught. Um, after catching and banding going through the process, the bird is fed and people are always concerned about the birds being stressed during the, during the process, but stressed animals don't eat and these birds will lap up the nectar. So the stress goes by the wayside, they're comfortable, they accept whatever's going on, they get a good feed and then they get released. They get put into a hand. And he sits there for a little bit until he realizes he can go if necessary. There's a little tap on the bottom of the hand and the bird realizes he can leave. So it's always a thrill to the people who are taking part and watching. The last two years, we haven't been able to have people observe. So we've kind of missed out on that part. Um, but they will sit there for a little bit before leaving. And the excitement on the faces here is the excitement is the same face the adults make. So it's an amazing thing to watch. And here's an example of a photo where you can actually see numbers H82 on the bands. And so we don't always have to catch them to identify it. This is the quality of my camera, um, but it's nice having people with good cameras stop by the yard. <laughs> um, that was Rufus. I should have said that um, I think I can see 66. He was J, J41366. I've memorized his band number. Adult males are easy to tell the difference between them. The one on the bottom right is the cal calliope. This is what I'm hoping the guy in my yard turns into, that, that those pink stripes flare out off of the body. This amazing looking bird. The one on the upper left is a black-chinned hummingbird. Um, I think broad tailed hummingbird in the middle, um, ruby throated on the right, oh, no, ruby, ruby throated on the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a rufous on the upper right, and then ruby throated on the bottom left. Females and young birds tend to just look green and white, and that's where it becomes difficult. You need to see the outer wing tip, the, the tip of the outer wing feather, in order to identify the difference between black chin and, and ruby throated. And then um, in the rufous, you have to notice the, the width of the outside tail feather. And if there's a notch on the second one from the middle. Um, so it, it gets more difficult identifying those. The one thing I do tell people is, well, I was asked why, why do all these birds show up in my yard, which has to do with, you know, birders are the ones that recognize them and so they're the ones that report them but at the same time um i'm i'm able to recognize it i have the knowledge for 20 years i knew what a calliope looked like 
So when this calliope came in looking kind of like this bird um, to most people, I was able to see that it was a calliope. So it's important to, to look for zebras instead of horses is, is the saying that I use. Um, if you're not looking for a zebra, every striped zebra is just a horse. So if you know that stripes a zebra, then you'll see zebras. So with the hummingbirds, I know what to look for. So I'm seeing them. And the fact that I'm seeing four of them, four different species in my yard now means they could be four in anybody else's yard and they know what they were, were looking for. Um, just to make matters worse or more difficult, you could have an albino or leucistic bird, or you could have a hybrid. And one of the things I hear, uh, actually, this is a ruby-throated hummingbird that just had green instead of red. Just confusing matters. Everything else said ruby-throated, but the, sometimes with a ruby-throated, with the way the light comes off it, it can look yellow, it can look black, but I, it can look not this green, but another green. But, but this bird in every light was green, just a pigment flaw in the bird. Uh, so you never know. But this is one that I get reported to me, used to get reported a lot, was the hummingbird that had two antennae and a curled nose and six legs. Um, hummingbird moth, this is a hummingbird clear wing um, that flies during the day, um, but it feeds like a hummingbird. And if you don't know, you would think that's what it is. Um, the sphinx moths that come out at night or at dusk or dawn usually are brown. They feed real fast and they're gone. The lighting is not good. You don't have binoculars. Um, so it's understandable that mistake. Um, this is a list of all the hummingbirds that have been seen in Florida. And for the people that think just ruby throat is the only one, a lot of these are just panhandle. The Cuban emerald is um, southeast. Oh, wait, Cuban emerald actually was in Tampa in like the 60s. What am, which one am I thinking of? Um, Bahama Woodstar is the southeast. Cuban emerald hasn't been officially accepted because there weren't photographs uh, taken at the time and they no longer accept just descriptions. So there have been two or three of them in the state, probably summer after hurricanes. So the eye is out to find one of those and get pictures and actually verify its existence. But that is more than people realize that these are all possibilities if you're, if you're aware of them and knowledgeable of what, how to identify them. If one of them shows in my yard, hopefully I'll be ready. Um, and these are species that have been seen in neighboring states that are potential as well. So there is a potential for like 18, 19 different species to um, be seen in the, in, in the state. And I think that rounds out what I had for that. Well, um, Steve, I have a question about um, the age of the hummingbirds. I know you yes. said you had the rufus that came back for eight years. So right. what is a uh, typical lifespan and does it vary with the species? It, it varies with species. The difficult point with typical lifespan is that there is so much mortality in the first year in migration um, that you might say the average age is four years, but there's a lot that die at one and two years, and there's a lot that live to six and seven years. Um, there are a number of six-year returning birds. I think ruby throats have been uh, a year or two longer than Rufus. I, that's, I think I don't have it for sure. Uh, but I know there have been a number of ruby throat recaptures that have been six, seven years, I think, for uh, within the state. I have a question, Steve. Yes. Um, can you tell us about migratory paths for hummingbirds in, across Florida? You know, where are these birds coming from and where do they go? Um, it's sort of an unanswered question specifically. Um, to my, the best I can say is they just migrate with the fronts um, through the state. They're, the hot spots are where people are looking for them and see them. Of course, on the coast, when in the spring, they're down on like the Yucatan and they get winds to head north if a front comes down, they follow the front into land. So places like Fort DeSoto, you look for 
uh, a storm coming through at about five in the morning. And there were birds that jumped off the Yucatan that, the night before that were flying that followed that into um, the first land. So birds following in front of the front land at Fort DeSoto at six in the morning or whatever. And that's typically a spring fallout. Um, and hummingbirds are part of that group as well. I recall a late April where there were hundreds of ruby throated at Fort DeSoto just after a front went through. Um, going through the state, and in the fall, it's kind of the same way if you've got a storm coming up that bumps into the southern bound birds, um, that'll, that'll knock them down. Um, but as far as uh, actual pathways through the state, I, I don't know of a, like a flyway through the mountains sort of thing where they go through the center of the state or whatever. Um, a lot of things hit the coast and stop for a few days before jumping. So if you're coastal on migration, it's probably better than um, during a season. They seem to be less common on the coasts in the, in the summer and, and winter. But the so timing, the, the timing is fairly consistent that they start in, in the spring or in the fall, where, where, where am I? Going into the fall, the birds nesting get up and they will move around through June and July before actually heading out. So young birds that show up in June or July may stay in the yard for a month before leaving. Um, but once the birds from the north, you get, and, and we're not, have not been able to catch the, the, some the banded birds in the winter and the summer, if we could catch them in the Carolinas and find out that Carolina birds come down to Florida in winter, that, that would be good to see. Um, but what we don't know is do the Carolina birds get up and head down to the Yucatan and do the Nova Scotia birds get up and head down to Florida? Um, we haven't been able to verify that yet. So, but you are saying they're going across the there, the there Gulf are, of Mexico. They do cross the Gulf of Mexico and, and the Gulf Coast birders and, and um, from, from speaking of Humnet, um, there's a number of the banders up there that um, have access to the oil rigs and they would be seen on the oil rigs um, offshore. So there's a large part of the migration that probably swings out heads down Mexico. Uh, but there's a good portion that goes over the Gulf and comes down Florida. And um, we do see migration through Florida. The assumption is, and, and some have been seen in Cuba. So the assumption is some of them come through Florida, hop Cuba and go down to uh, Yucatan as well. So um, it would be great if we could catch more summering birds. Um, I'm not sure. I know that if we've got flowers with the way we do the banding, it's hard to catch the birds in the, going into the cage at the feeder if they've got flowers. So I'm not sure if that's part of the summering issue or if we just don't have banders in the place where our wintering birds go in the summer. Hey, Brad. Again, again, it's a needle in a haystack. To, the, the few that we band compared to the numbers that are up there. It's always amazing when we do get one. We, we, had a few of the Western species that were banded two or three ways, places along their path, but haven't been lucky with ruby throats. Hey, Fred. What's that? It's Steve. It's Steve. Steve. Okay. Oh, Steve. Sorry. Fred's a bander. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> I've been paying attention to. Yeah. Um, what's the average lifespan of a hummingbird? Well, that's where we were saying it's kind of hard to say the the rufous hummingbird that I had the oldest rufous hummingbird was eight eight years and three months which would be uh arriving at the um wintering habitat had had the rufus has been in my yard for seven years showed up this year he would potentially be the oldest on record but I've also seen record of eight years and 11 months which would be leaving the wintering grounds which had he showed up and left in the spring, then he would have been qualified for both of those. So he would have been the oldest. But when you talk average, there is a very high mortality the first year or two, that first migration. So that pulls the average down. There are a number of birds being re-caught re that were banded four or five, six years later previously. 
So I think on average it's four or six is what they say, but migration's really rough and a lot of first years don't make it through. And that do holds the average humming, Do all hummingbirds migrate or do some hang out year round? All ruby-throated hummingbirds that we are aware of migrate. There are no um, stationary, there are no non-migratory races of ruby-throateds, which is the standard bird in, in Florida. Um, there are a number of people that report having them year round, but the only ones that are verified or known, you get summer, you get northern birds that come down in the winter about, and winter down here about the same time the summering birds here leave. So you never really see a changeover of birds. Birds are always in the same place, or there's always birds around and birds do what birds do. So the preferred habitat, the preferred perch of one bird is gonna be the preferred perch of another bird likely. <laughs> so people don't notice a change in the habits of the birds. So they assume it's the same bird. And if, it's a, if their wintering bird is here for the third year and their summering bird is here for the third or fourth year, they're all, they're both familiar with the person, so the, they're going to act pretty much the same. So, so the short answer is it's complicated. The the well, the short answer is there are some other species that are not migratory, but most ah. are. Um, ah. Okay, so does Florida have any of these non-migratory? Florida Florida does not have any non-migratory okay. birds, hummingbirds that we're aware of. Okay, and and anything that we have banded has always left. So. Um, that's another indicator. And ones that we have banded have not been found somewhere else in the state. And that's part of that pink mark on the head helps you at least recognize if we put a big pink mark on the head, somebody's going to see it if it goes somewhere else and stays. Although the first molt, it's gone. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't last that long. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question for Steve. Yes. Um, have you ever heard of hummingbirds getting caught in screen enclosures? They have issues of the bills going in. Oh, cutting. Oh, yeah. Um, hummingbirds are very curious, especially the young mm -hmm. birds. Um, <clears throat> anything red, they will check out. And that's part of the red flower thing. And the red on the feeders is they don't know what food is, but they know red says food. So they check it all out. So if there's a light inside and the door open, or inside a garage, you've got a reflector on a bicycle or something and you close the door. Um, yeah, they have been caught in, in, well, in I just, and garages and things like that. Yeah, no, I was at a friend of mine's home and she had some plants inside her screen lanai yeah. and she saw a hummingbird stuck in the screen enclosure. So she went and pulled them out. But I was like yeah. thinking, wow. And that was the there's first- There's a lot of home. That was the first stuck in my mind went to, and then I converted to thinking it was trapped inside of. But yeah, the um, uh, part of the territorial issue is they chase, they go very fast. Um, mm -hmm. And they have been known to spear the bill through, and quite often it kind of scrapes the bill. <laughs> and a lot of the birds that have bill dam damage to their bill, it's believed they stabbed into screen and managed to pull themselves out. Um, but there's, there's question as to how often that happens, how often, I, I mentioned earlier with the perky pet feeder and, and the uh, bee guard, if they've got their bill implanted in, you know, put inside that um, yellow plastic grid, and some bird comes down to chase it away and it yanks out and lifts up at the same time, it's possible they can scrape their bill on something like that. But, but yeah, I have heard multiple issues of them stabbing their bill into screen. So do you think it's because they're trying to get out of plants inside the screen or? I'm guessing it's more, I mean, I don't know that they can't see the screen. I'm guessing it, most yeah. of the reports I get are they were being chased and ran into it. Okay. Uh, maybe in the chase of another hummingbird, they didn't see the screen as a block and tried to fly through kind of like the birds hit windows because the reflection of the sky behind them is in the window and they think it's a clear shot to fly through. So if they're not recognizing the screen as a block, they may be hitting it bill first and stabbing into it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I wanted to ask if um, 
your flowering maple that, that you mentioned, do they root from cuttings? Or yes, they do. They do? They root okay, from good. cuttings. Usually when people come to the yard, I look for a place where it kind of laid down and touched and rooted oh, okay. uh, itself, but, but they will root from cuttings. I just had a small one that's looking pretty bad after it yeah. froze. <laughs> so yeah, thanks, Steve. It's a great program. Really enjoyed it. You're welcome. So Steve, I hear a lot of um, comments from people or see them online that where they think they don't have any hummingbirds and you know that they should only put their feeders up at certain times of the year. So um, I believe you said to keep them up all year. I just want to reiterate that. Yeah, my, my recommendation is to hang at least one feeder year round until you know when you're likely to have them. Uh, I mean, if you've got flowers, you don't need feeders, but then if you've got flowers in a big yard and they're feeding in the back corner, you won't know. The feeder brings them up to where you can see them and the feeder brings them up to if there is an issue with the flowers. Um, it gets hard for me to maintain a feeder during the two or three months of the summer when I'm not seeing them. Um, so I understand that. But if, if every now and then <clears throat> during the summer, there's a couple of days where I'll see one bird, two weeks later, I'll see another one. So um, if you run with the idea of that bird is there that day, it could be there another day or there could be another bird there. Um, if you make up one cup of water and a quarter cup of sugar and you have a small feeder that fills a portion of that feeder um, you know, four or five times, if you're putting a quarter cup of uh, solution into the feeder, and if every two or three days you take it out, run hot water in it, and um, hang it back up, it's not that much work. I've been running 20 feeders. That's a lot of work. <laughs> but even with 20 feeders, I go through uh, two cups of sugar in a week, which isn't much compared to if you were feeding birdseed. Okay, well, Steve, that was a great program. Thank you so much. You're and welcome. if you have questions, um, Steve gave you, I believe, his email and then his um, Facebook site is Hummingbirds in Florida. And that's a very active site. So you can learn a lot there. And um, again, we really appreciate you taking a um, day off today from work and talking about hummingbirds. Um, I do want to give a plug. Um, Tampa Audubon has their monthly meeting this coming Thursday, and our speaker is uh, from Cuba, and we'll be talking about Cuban birds. Um, and Anne, if you want to add any more details to that, but you could see that on Zoom. Everyone's invited, tampaaudubon.org, and that's Thursday night at 7 p.m.